Good morning. I'm Sue Markham from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. This is a press conference on the issue of torture prevention. As you may be aware, this month of October, we have many reports of, from the UN independent human rights experts to the General Assembly. Um, it is the whole month of October, and we are presenting some of them as uh, press conferences for your uh, benefit, and many of the special rapporteurs and other independent experts are available for media interviews. If you wish to have uh, that set up, you should s contact our office. I, I believe that the, you have the list of the press conferences that we have scheduled so far. It's with the spokesman's office, and there's also a list of when the independent experts make their uh, present their reports to the third committee if you wish to have that to navigate through. So the, this morning we have three UN independent human rights experts on the issue of torture prevention. Dr. Jens Modvik, the chair of the Committee Against Torture. Sir Malcolm Evans, the chair of the subcommittee on the prevention of torture. And uh, Professor Nils Meltzer, who's the Special Rapporteur on Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. So they'll each um, make some remarks and then we'll open it to any questions. Thank you. Dr. Modwit. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for your interest. Uh, since we have here three different mandates with the same purpose, namely uh, fighting torture, it might be useful just to stress that uh, the Committee Against Torture are the custodians of the Convention Against Torture. Like this? Good. Fine. Okay. I'd prefer if you can hear what I say. Thank you. <clears throat> the Convention Against Torture is not just a declaration that torture is prohibited. Rather, it's a legally binding instrument where all those 164 states that have ratified it have actually committed themselves to implement all the provisions of the Convention and to be scrutinized by the Committee Against Torture, the CAT, every four years. And uh, this means that they have to report to us, uh, and we uh, consider the report in a two-day Q&A session in Geneva, and we issue uh, concluding observations as a result of those. And these are concerns and recommendations on how those states' parties to the Convention should behave in order to implement uh, effectively the uh, Convention. The Convention both uh, uh, obliges states' parties to uh, prevent torture through having uh, appropriate procedures for interrogation and custody, and it also ensures that victims of torture are entitled to redress and uh, rehabilitation. This year, we have scrutinized 18 state parties, uh, as we normally do. And maybe I should stress that, that even countries uh, like uh, the United States, Russia, China, Venezuela, Israel, are state parties to the convention, but they would probably not invite uh, my good colleagues inside right away. So uh, in that way, the mandates supplement each other, and uh, we take care of, of uh, issues that uh, uh, Sir Malcolm and uh, Professor Melzer uh, are unable to do, and vice versa, they do uh, uh, work that we cannot do in the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are you able to hear me now? Okay. Good. Um, well, as, as my colleague said, um, I'm chair of the UN Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture, and we work in a rather different way, but a uh, complementary uh, way to, to, the, to that of my colleagues. The optional protocol um, is applicable in 88 countries around the world, so that's a little over half the number of states' parties to the Convention Against Torture itself. So we do not have quite so broad um, a, a geographical coverage. But the nature of our work is, is, is rather different. Um, we have basically two elements to our, our, our mandate. Um, the first is that we have the capacity to decide ourselves to visit states' parties and to enter into any place where we believe that people may be deprived of their liberty. And at the end of our visits, then we produce um, comments and reports to the 
uh, relevant state and then seek to follow up on the implementation of that, building very much on what we have seen in practice. And this re relates not only to conditions of detention or any examples of ill treatment, but things to do with the operation of legal safeguards, oversight mechanisms, etc., etc. This all, of course, sounds rather exciting, um, and indeed it can be. Um, however, from a, a reportage point of view, it's something of a disappointment um, because the reports that we um, publish are confidential. Um, and one of the um, interesting elements of the, the optional protocol system is that we do have these, uh, these powers of entry, but the reports that we produce and the dialogue is confidential with the state unless the state chooses to make it public. Um, the good news is that many states actually do um, and make their reports public, which of course we encourage. The second element of our mandate is um, really rather different, but um, at least as important, and that is that all states who have become a party to the optional protocol are legally obliged to establish a mechanism operating at the national, me national level, which basically can do as we can do, i.e. to establish a wholly independent mechanism operating within the country that has got free reign access whenever it wishes to any place where it believes at the national level people may be being um, deprived of their liberty. And so, whilst in many countries around the world one may feel that such oversight inspection mechanisms and inspectorates are, un un are perfectly normal, I can assure you that in many, most countries in the world they are not. And likewise, in just about all countries, it is surprising to discover there are some corners where people are being detained which don't fall within the scope of, nor of existing mechanisms, and our role is to make sure that, that they do. So very much of our work is focused on encouraging states to establish, as they are legally obliged to do, those mechanisms, and then when they are in place, trying to work with them and alongside them to encourage them in their work to try to ensure they can work as best they can and that they are not subject to any um, unwarranted fetter or restraint on, on what they do. So those are basically the, the, the two things that, that, that we do. Um, I think all I would really like to do today is just give um, just a, a flavour of, 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 of how that work has gone. So, for example, in the course of this last year, um, we have visited a broad range of countries, including Spain, Morocco, Burkina Faso, Uruguay, Belize, Portugal, Poland, and Kyrgyzstan. Our, our next visit will be to Liberia. I shall be leading that delegation myself in a couple of weeks' time. And we've already announced um, a range of visits, as I mentioned in our statement, next year, um, for the beginning of next year, including visits to Burundi, to Costa Rica, to Senegal, and Switzerland. So you see that we cover you know, many swathes of the, of the world. It's also um, important to um, note that in the course of the last year, um, the number of states choosing to enter this preventive system um, has, has, has increased, and we were very pleased with four new um, ratifications, each of which present their own challenges in terms of getting the national mechanisms in place, just as, as, as all countries do. And those were Afghanistan, Australia, Palestine, and Sri Lanka. And so these um, have now all joined the OPCAT club and, we'll, and we will be, indeed we are, working with all of them in different ways to try to establish independent mechanisms of oversight in places of detention in those countries. But not all states, I'm afraid to say, actually get round to do this as swiftly as they should. And one of the big problems which we do face is trying to ensure that a relatively small number of states which are yet to establish these mechanisms as they are obliged to do, do so and do, um, and, and, and do so well. And as I highlighted in my... Um, statement to the General Assembly yesterday. The list of those countries which have not yet done so, um, in the view of our committee, does remain too long. It currently comprises Benin, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Chile, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, Liberia, Nauru, Nigeria, Panama, and the Philippines. On the other hand, there are at least 60 such mechanisms, 65 such mechanisms established around the world, meaning that there is independent inspection taking place day by day within this system in hundreds and hundreds of places around the world, seeing and speaking directly to thousands of detainees. And I think that's a major achievement for the UN um, to be supporting a system of this nature. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, perhaps also a couple of words uh, on my mandate. I'm the United Nations Special Rapporteur on torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And uh, the distinction, perhaps, between my mandate and uh, uh, the mandates of my two colleagues here is that I'm not, my mandate has not been established by a treaty. I'm mandated directly by the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, which means also that it has the advantage that my mandate is not limited to states party to a particular treaty, but I have a universal mandate. I can basically address or communicate and engage with states that haven't ratified any human rights treaty at all. So it's basically maybe a little of the grassroots movement. Um, the disadvantage is that states don't have a legal obligation to cooperate with me. So uh, we have to put things I into balance, but I think it's 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 very important complementary mandate to the treaty bodies. And it, there are basically three activity pillars for my mandate. One is to do uh, individual uh, communications on behalf of individual victims of torture or persons threatened uh, by, to be extradited to uh, places where they might be exposed to torture or uh, persons, convicts on death row that might uh, uh, appeal to me to intervene on their behalf. And I, I can intervene within a couple of hours, basically, to the foreign minister of, of any UN member country. So that is something that I do on a daily basis. I receive about 10 to 15 requests per day, and I have a team at the High Commissioner's Office that supports me in, in carrying out these interventions. Um, a second pillar is to do uh, country visits, so similar to what the, uh, um, the subcommittee is doing, but not based on a treaty. So it's simply based on the invitation of the, the host country, and there I can then also, under similar terms, uh, access all uh, places of detention and, and examine this, the situation as re regards to the implementation of the prohibition of torture and ill treatment in that country. And the third pillar is that I report to the General Assembly once a year and to the Council in Geneva once a year on a thematic topic that I can pick up uh, and choose freely. So, for example, a year ago to the General Assembly, I reported on excessive police violence and its relationship to the prohibition of torture and treatment. Uh, in spring, I reported on migration-related torture because there's obviously millions of people that are somehow between jurisdictions and suffering uh, 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 atrocious uh, ill treatment, uh, uh, very, very much in the shadow of public attention, I would say. Um, and uh, my current report to the General Assembly that I presented yesterday focuses on the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, and obviously it is also that instrument that for the first time codified albeit not in a binding manner, but codified the prohibition of torture uh, on a universal level. And so I wanted to kind of take stock what has been achieved in terms of creating a normative and institutional framework for the protection of, of all humans from torture and ill-treatment, where the main challenges are today and what my recommendations would be to address those challenges. And I, I, I won't, uh, you know, uh, go through all these recommendations, but I think I can kind of regroup them into three main concerns that I wanted to address with my recommendations. And the first would be that I feel that the, pre that the prohibition of torture and ill-treatment has been severely undermined by policies and practices in areas such as counterterrorism or extraordinary renditions or irregular migrations. Um, and, and policies that are perceived to bring short-term benefits but actually are implemented at the cost of, of seriously weakening the protection of, of human rights and the rule of law, and even public security and safety uh, in the long run. The second area is that somehow related, I feel that there is an increasing tendency to have violent and discriminatory political narratives and practices based on stigmatization, demonization, and, and kind of marginalization where certain groups, particularly groups with specific vulnerabilities, be it uh, LGBTI persons, uh, again, persons in ir irregular migration status, uh, be it persons with disabilities in certain areas, are, uh, 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 should I say, disproportionately exposed to the risk of, of, of abuse, uh, including uh, ill-treatment and torture. 
And third, and that's a long-standing uh, concern, I think, of the mandate and, 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 and everyone trying to uh, work for the prevention of torture and ill-treatment worldwide, that the judicial systems and, and police and investigative systems are still very much based on confessions, kind of uh, focused uh, uh, pro processes. And that involves, we can see that in experience, a very high risk of torture and ill-treatment because what you want to achieve is a confession that confirms your suspicion, and in order to achieve that, uh, pressure is often applied, and that pressure can very easily uh, uh, go down a, sli a slide down a slippery slope into torture and ill-treatment. So that's a, a, a very important concern that needs to be addressed, to move away from coercive interrogation into actual fact-finding investigative uh, uh, interviewing. And uh, so, so these would kind of be the, the main concerns I addressed in the report. I'd be, I'd be happy to obviously uh, uh, respond to any questions you have. Perhaps also as a, as a last point, uh, in terms of country visits, during my tenure, the, the two years I've had this mandate now, I've, been, I've visited Turkey uh, in the, right in the beginning, a couple of months after the attempted coup. I've visited Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, I've visited uh, Argentina uh, and the Ukraine, including some of the, the, the territories that are not under control of the government, the, the, the Donbass, the so-called self-declared republics of Donetsk and Luhansk, and the detainees uh, that are controlled by these uh, armed groups there. And uh, the next visits I envisage to carry out are to the Comoros and uh, Mongolia and Paraguay. Um, yes, well, thank you. Questions? Yes, please. On behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thank you to the panel for coming to speak with us. My name is Sherman Bryceby, South African Broadcasting. Perhaps we can start with you, Professor Meltzer. My question is about the journalist in, in Turkey and, uh, that was uh, allegedly killed in the Saudi uh, consulate. Uh, some reports have called this a botched interrogation. Some are reading that as torture. Uh, other reports now are saying that the Turkish investigators have found evidence that Jamal Khashoggi was killed inside the consulate. What do you believe the correct course of action is for the international community? And what do you make of some calls now that are growing that the United Nations lead an investigation and establish the facts? And, and your colleagues are welcome to weigh in. Well, obviously, this is a very, let's say, fresh, hot story. We don't know the facts. Uh, they haven't been established. But obviously, establishing the facts is is extremely important. Um, I, I would say that, uh, first of all, this would be the, uh, the responsibility of the involved states, uh, certainly the, the state that has jurisdiction over, over the piece of, of, of territory where the, the events are alleged to have, have taken place, being uh, Saudi Arabia and also, secondly, or certainly also uh, Turkey. If, if no solution can be found in, in, in conducting a, 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 a credible uh, and objective investigation on that level, then perhaps at some point international mechanisms should get involved. I think we're a little bit uh, early in, in the process to come to a definite conclusion there, because obviously uh, this is a very delicate issue, and I think we should give the involved states time under public scrutiny to come to a, a conclusion that it has to, they want to address this, this, this problem. Does to comment? Yes, please. Well, actually not on the concrete case, but uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, ratified the Convention Against Torture, and we uh, reviewed uh, their report, considered their report, along with uh, alternative reports uh, two years ago, 2016. And, of course, one of the concerns that that the committee raises in general, and this was also uh, the case with Saudi Arabia, was whether human rights defenders and journalists can operate freely or whether they risk uh, scrutiny or reprisals for their uh, legitimate actions. So this is a general concern of the committee, and, and I guess that concern is, might be relevant here as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Edith Slatteroff from the Associated Press, uh, following up on Sherwin's questions. Um, first, uh, to Mr. Modvig, is, is there any possibility that you, in light of the Khashoggi case, whatever it is, 
that the committee might go back and look at um, what's happening in Saudi Arabia. And uh, Mr. Evans, is um, Saudi Arabia a signatory to the optional protocol? And uh, Professor Melser, um, you said you got 10 to 15 requests a day. Have you received any request in the past week or two um, asking that you look into the Khashoggi case? Thank you very much. <clears throat> the committee is not very likely to react directly on cases that we learn from newspapers and the like. But what we do do is have a constant follow-up procedure. Actually, every time we issue concluding observations, and the same applied with uh, Saudi Arabia two years ago, we ask for uh, follow-up on certain uh, urgent recommendations, and we uh, consider a report from the state party uh, as part of that. So any event that f falls under the follow-up procedure would, in principle, be uh, relevant to the follow-up uh, of the committee. But whether it will take place here concrete, I cannot say. Thank you. The short answer is that Saudi Arabia is not a party to the optional protocol, um, although Turkey is. Um, yeah. And can you tell us exactly what the optional protocol does? It, it, mm. it's the, it, just allows for the inspect you you can go in yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, not particularly I, <laughs> well I, I I'm, I'm not aware of any correct it's possible that it has been a request has been submitted because I'm not the one that actually opens the inbox with all these you know every day so so my, my team has not yet transmitted if, if it has been transmitted to, to us through official channels I haven't received it yet but I think it's unlikely because it's so much in the open that uh, usually I'm I'm involved in cases that the public is not aware of and my function is to actually bring it to public attention now, at a later stage, if, you know, should, if events evolve in a direction where we can see that one of the, the involved states does not uh, fulfill its international obligations in regard to you know, being cooperative in investigating this case, then obviously it might be an occasion where I could intervene also publicly and, and, and call on the involved states to fulfill their obligations. But I, as I said before, I think we're a bit early in the, at an early stage now. I'm Celia Mendoza from VOA Latin America. Um, you were mentioning um, the members of the treaty um, are Venezuela and other countries. And Venezuela has been um, accused by the international community and some of the members in Latin America of abuses and torture, particularly. Um, just this week, one of the councilmen who came to the United Nations to report on the abuses of human rights um, died under the custody of the government, Fernando Alban, and um, it's been a call for an investigation and possible abuses of a uh, torture gone wrong and the possibility of a cover-up with the possible suicide. Um, what is your um, take on that in particular? We know that Venezuela has been a subject um, to calls for investigations on torture, abuses of human rights. It is a possibility for a visit to Venezuela, um, and I understand that um, Nicaragua might be the other country in the region that um, might be, um, you probably have received calls to investigate. What can you tell us about these two particular um, situations in the region for all of you. Uh, yeah, I, if I remember correctly, I, I know that we've discussed the possibility of con conducting a visit to Venezuela and also to Nicaragua. If my memory doesn't betray me, we have submitted formal requests but not received any, any uh, Answered. It's just also that something that we anticipated that it would be extremely difficult to get accepted for a visit. Um, these types of countries that are obviously involved in 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 in, in situations that are highly publicized, that are extremely uh, 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 marked by tensions, it's very difficult to get invited to conduct visits, especially if they don't have legal obligations 
as it is the case with my mandate. So um, I think uh, Turkey and Ukraine were exceptions in this regard, both countries obviously affected by a crisis, uh, and inviting me to, to visit in basically in the midst of, of, of a crisis. But uh, that's not been the case for these two countries. Yeah. Well, simply to say that uh, Venezuela, this is going to sound like quite a refrain, is not one of our state's parties, so um, it's not within our, our, our sphere. Um, Nicaragua is um, a state party to the, to, the, to the OPCAT, and if I'm fiddling rudely with my phone, it's just that I'm trying to remind myself when it was that um, we, we, um, we, we uh, last had a... I, I can't see it off the top of my, my head. You know, our, our work in relation to Nicaragua has largely focused on the establishment of the, of the national mechanism um, at the, you know, at, at the, at the, at, at the moment. I'm, I'm saying that, but I, I, I need to, um, yes, the, we, we did a visit to, to Nicaragua back in 2014, quite some while ago, um, but um, I just wanted to check the report is still confidential, so there's not a lot I can say about that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a bore, I know. But, um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, the reply is the same as for Saudi Arabia, namely that uh, we reviewed Venezuela, who is a party to the Convention Against Torture, I believe in 2014 or 15, and uh, due to the deterioration of the situation immediately after, uh, 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 immediately after our review, we uh, did an exception, namely that we requested uh, a specific follow-up uh, report from Venezuela, which they actually provided. And uh, we reviewed that. And the, the cases that you're mentioning, uh, maybe not that different than other cases that were uh, on the table of the committee at that point, will, of course, be a part of the follow-up assessment and the preparation for the next review of Venezuela, which uh, will probably take place in some two years' time or around there. So it, it will, like uh, we discussed in Saudi Arabia, that those events and cases are all taken into consideration in the preparations of the review of the State Party's report. Hello, uh, Matthias Ask from TV2 Norway. Um, there's been some mention that this incident in Istanbul happened because repressive regimes now feel emboldened since the United States has retreated on human rights in the past year and a half. Is there enough proof or data to be say that this truly is happening from your point of view? If I may, I think it's too early to say. Uh, there might be uh, signs and symptoms here and there that, that this is the case. But on the other hand, what we notice in the Committee Against Torture is also that there's an increased transparency of violations of human rights and torture. For instance, on several occasions, immediately before our review of a state party, we have received videos and videos have been released to the public of torture. This has been the case in Ecuador, where a video surveillance from a prison was uh, slipped to YouTube. And in Russia, this uh, July-August session, where uh, this uh, uh, Marikov uh, uh, torture video from the prison were uh, released just one week before we were scrutinizing uh, the delegation from, from Russia. So in a way, you could say, well, that might be the case, and there's a bolton. Uh, it's too early to say. But on the other hand, uh, accountability is increasing as well. And that's uh, uh, something good for the, for the uh, international uh, uh, guardians like, like the three mandates you have here. Could you describe what would accountability look like in a, in a case like this? Sure. Bodies be held accountable if, if the allegations... Well, that's a hypothetical situation. What is not a hypothetical situation is what happened with this Russian uh, uh, video that was released in July, because uh, the delegation then informed the committee that uh, they had uh, detained uh, 17 prison guards uh, for uh, investigation of, of the, the torture. It was a 10-minute video of Falanga torture uh, committed by uh, some some 20 prison guards, and it was uh, videotaped by a body-worn camera. 
and uh, released to the opposition press. And what the committee could do is to put this in in our urgent follow-up recommendations. And we have now asked Russia to give an account in one year's time of what was the course of the investigation, prosecution, and punishment that took place in that uh, uh, case. So that's, I think, is clear-cut uh, accountability. Thank you. Maybe just to compliment on the, on the initial question, whether there has been kind of a, a downgrading, perhaps, of the of the human rights protection. I think, if, if obviously, these kinds of individual assassinations or of persons in custody. I don't think there is any kind of uh, trend towards perceiving this as lawful or something like this. But if slightly related to that, if you look at targeted killings, where you have persons being targeted outside that are not arrested through the drone operations and so on, I think over the last 15 years we've seen a, a strong trend towards kind of a public tolerance of this type of operation actually taking place on a regular basis. When that happened the first time in the early 2000s, uh, the public was much more kind of uh, agitated about it than, than they are today. Today, this is kind of an, uh, an op modus operandi against suspected terrorists, which I find is quite remarkable uh, because the, it obviously has, has dramatic consequences for the individual uh, that is being targeted. It's, it's the absolute uh, uh, right to life that is being uh, affected here. And it's far from certain that we are always in a situation of combat or... or, or with, with, with legitimate military targets. So that, that's one thing. I think we see a strong trend there uh, where I feel there's an erosion, a strong erosion of, of the right to life. Um, and we see it in other contexts such as, I think, particularly uh, irregular migration where uh, states uh, consciously take uh, policies and, and, and take on practices that put these irregular migrants uh, into, into danger and, and I think knowingly um, expose them to risks of, of torture and abuse uh, in order just to avoid them reaching their jurisdiction and, and having to accord them the whole protection uh, uh, that is due to uh, asylum seekers and so on. So I, I, I think on several levels we see a downgrading of, of the actual effectiveness of human rights protection. Um, but I don't think in these particular specific cases that, that, that we're talking about now, persons uh, being killed in custody, I think they're... Uh, we don't see that trend yet, and hopefully they will never see it. It seems to me that a whole host of things do feed into, um, should we say, changing times and changing perceptions, and whilst I can't rule it out, I would be rather surprised if it could be conclusively determined that the change of stance of one country was so significant that it changed an entire trajectory of what other countries were or were not doing um, in, in, in that regard. There is always a danger that one thinks that one's own state practice is so important that that's the only thing that dictates what the rest of the world does. And... Um, um, very occasionally that's true, but rarely is it as, 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 as quite as straightforward and causal as that. I think, as, as my colleagues have said, what has been notable and visible over the past few years is to say a general changing climate around human rights protections more, more generally um, that does mean that I think that increasingly um, states do feel that it is not necessarily so problematic for them um, to be seen to be, to be breaching some fundamental human rights if they determine that that is what their state is in their interests to do. Um, and so that then um, perhaps is the more generic um, movement that perhaps gives something of a, of, 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 of a green light that we need to be very vigilant about. But I, I think the, 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 the other thing I would like to say by way of counterpoint is I think it's very important that we don't get um, overly, overly focused, indeed overly fixated on what one could call the high profile incidents. It's not because they're not important, but what they can do is then turn your eyes to the, uh, away from the reality of what's going on in so many places on a routine, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's actually what takes place on a routine day-to-day -day basis and the attitudes that 
that are embedded in those day-to-day -day routine practices that actually pave the way over time for the possibility of some of these more high-profile incidents from actually erupting and gaining that, that visibility. And so there is a, a danger that, as ever, we only focus on the tip of the iceberg when it appears above the water. And it's important to recall that there are, you know, should we say, icebergs floating, <laughs> to, uh, to overextend the analogy. Uh, can icebergs float in all countries? Probably in none, literally, but I'm sure you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. I have um, a few questions. The first one regarding the um, the American the borders uh, and the detention of uh, non-documented immigrants on the American border. Whether you are investigating in this direction, whether you see it also as part of your mandates. And the second one is regarding Israel and the fact that they are part of the convention, but they're not, if I'm not mistaken, and they're not allowing anyone, any party to get there and investigate. Can you say more about um, the situation of Palestinians in Gaza, specifically lately, um, the killing of 200 Palestinians and also torture in uh, against Palestinian presidents, uh, f um, prisoners in Israeli prisons. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, well, yes, uh, border detention, whether by the U.S. or any other states, uh, clearly I consider to be relevant uh, for the prohibition of torture and, and ill treatment, uh, particularly because there, in many contexts, uh, people are being detained very often on on an indefinite uh, basis, and uh, not always because there are no procedures to actually take care of the case, but it's sometimes uh, states also use that deliberately as a tool of coercing those uh, potential uh, asylum seekers to, to leave, because the only way for them to leave detention is to go back. <laughs> Or, or families are being separated uh, under the pretext of, you know, we can't uh, detain women and men together or children, and we can't detain children, so we put them somewhere else. And so p families are being separated, and then the asylum procedure is being drawn into an unbearable length of three years or something like this, and, and, and the family is being told, we can only join you together if you leave. You go back voluntarily. Now, how vol voluntary is that? So in... in I think there's plenty of practices like this that are that deliberately employ emotional suffering uh, uh, in order to coerce uh, persons and, and deter them from applying uh, for asylum or, try, or, or other forms of stay. So to me, that was really what my, my last report at the Human Rights Council was about, and I think that, that's a very, a very important uh, a topic because it, it affects millions of people. I mean, we're talking, you know, 65 million people that are on the move in these types of irregular contexts, and and so that's more than the population of France, right? It's 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 also relevant in terms of of the the the, the, the scale of the phenomenon. Now, well, Israel, the Gaza context, I think. It, it is relevant, I consider, for, certainly for my mandate, because uh, torture and ill treatment does not only occur in in custody. I'm not saying that in every use of force there would amount to torture or ill treatment, not, not at all. But crowd control situations and excessive use of force in law enforcement situations may well amount to cruel and human or degrading treatment um, when we determine that there is no justification that it's clearly excessive use of force. And I, I, I don't want to analyze facts now of, of cases, uh, of, of 200 cases that I don't have precisely before me, but I think it's important to be aware that authorities that manage these types of situations have to be aware that they are under the prohibition of torture and ill-treatment and that that does involve so-called extra-custodial use of force outside situations of, of custody as well. When the Committee Against Torture reviewed the United States in 2014, uh, the expedited uh, returns was actually uh, one of the things that uh, we took a lot of interest in because uh, from the point of view of the committee, one of the most important things when, my, when we talk about migration is identifying those of the asylum seekers that are victims of torture so that 
the torture can be a part of the refugee status determination procedure and that they can be treated accordingly as victims of torture entitled to redress. So th this was uh, already then, uh, while the migration problems were maybe not as big as they are today, uh, an issue. As for the uh, uh, Israeli treatment of uh, Palestinian detainees, uh, this was also, of course, uh, a, a concern of the committee, uh, particularly uh, in terms of the uh, right to fundamental legal safeguards. That is the right to uh, to have a lawyer uh, present during the interrogation, the right to have your arrest uh, decided by a court, and the right to a medical investigation uh, at your request. And these concerns were raised with Israel. I would like to say also in connection with, with the question from before that from the more optimistic side, uh, uh, we see very clearly in the committee that standards are moving forward that scrutiny and accountability is increasing. Uh, we recommend state parties that have not ratified the optional protocol to do so, and once they have, we also assess the effectiveness of the national preventive mechanism, the visiting mechanisms. And if their mandate is to uh, limit it or their resources are to limit it, this is a concern that the committee raises. We also, of course, recommend uh, that all state parties invite the special procedures, including uh, Professor Meltzer's uh, mandate, so that scrutiny increases. And we do this publicly. It's being webcasted. All our documents are uh, public. Uh, the civil society organizations receive them and can carry them on uh, uh, and, and hold state parties accountable to the uh, concluding observations of the committee. So in, in, in maybe what might be some concerning, as, uh, as uh, Malcolm said, tip of the icebergs, there's also a continuous pro process which increases accountability. And I think that's the, that's the good news. Mr. Malcolm, you wish to comment? Yes, just briefly on, on that. I, I think just to underline what my, my colleagues have said, I think one of the most, um, you know, a hugely important development that has taken place against the background of the increase in focus on immigration and immigration detention is the realisation of the extent to which this previously was shockingly rather a completely a largely unregulated area. Um, you've had all the systems and structures that applied to, let us call it, the normal criminal justice system, uh, which were simply inapplicable in this regard. The normal safeguards that you would expect uh, were non-applicable, non um, but the, um, the oversight mechanisms that you would normally expect in prisons places of detention didn't apply because they were not places of detention in that sense. And one of the things that at least now I think has come to be understood is that immigration detention centres are you know, it's in the word. They are places of detention. Um, and therefore, they do need to be scrutinised in a way that is appropriate to that, to that status. And much is being done to draw them into that frame um, in a way that simply wasn't even some years ago. Then I can tell you that there are still... Um, it wasn't so many years ago that the official line was that uh, there was in anyone in so-called immigration detention wasn't in detention at all because, of course, they were free to leave whenever they wished. All they need to do was go away. Um, now, of course, that's utterly implausible from our point of view, but in fact that was an official line, and indeed in some countries um, still in case is. Now, people have moved on from that, but I can still think of one country we visited that had better remain nameless, that it was, it was still quite interesting in what appeared to be what one could say one of the more, should we say, militarised and securitised places I think I have been, and I have been in, in many, um, they still held quite firmly to the line that the places involved and the people there were not in detention. Um, to the extent that um, when I said, you know, could we go and, you know, we'd like now to talk to some of the detainees, I was roundly um, put down that they had no def uh, ref um, detainees there, but if I wished, I could go and speak to the guests. Well, I really should draw to a close because we have to be out of here, but if you wish to ask a few questions um, after... Could, after could I ask... Uh, okay. Question. Um... What is the trend in um, cases of torture globally? Are you seeing more? Are you seeing less? Are all these accountability mechanisms having an impact? Or 
body cameras, YouTube, uh, social media having an impact? Yeah, well, I, I think there's various levels here. Obviously, social media and, and, and the accessibility of information uh, certainly has improved protection or maybe even opened um, kind of playing fields and, 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 and fora for discussing these issues and for presenting evidence that simply have not existed before. So I think that there's a new kind of dimension there that is, that is beneficial. Um, on the other hand, I also feel that perhaps the, 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 the framework that has been uh, established in terms of norms and institutions, including ours, our mechanisms, um, um, they're being challenged also by the present policies that we've addressed, be it in migration, be it in counterterrorism or, or other areas, and where we, I think, have to be honest that we also see a certain erosion and a, a certain increase of, of, of tolerance, even in public opinion, that you know, uh, torture uh, is sometimes argued to, it works, right? <laughs> some, some, we, we've heard that argument, and it's a very dangerous argument because international law does not prohibit things that don't work. Um, it prohibits things that work and that are being done because they work, but they may work for the wrong purposes. They don't, torture does not work to find the truth, but it works to break people, to intimidate people, and to, 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 to control people. And, and uh, but in that sense, we can say, you know, genocide works and slavery works, and obviously that does not justify these things. So it's very important how do we talk about these things and that we see through these different screens and, uh, and see the danger that is lurking somehow when we change the way in which we talk about the torture and ill treatment. Um, to comment, Sir Malcolm? Um, and I'm afraid that this will have to be the end, I'm afraid. You, you, it's very, you, you, uh, talking in terms of global trends is always difficult because you know, the world's a little bit too complicated for global trends in any, in any direction. Um, what I think is certainly the case is that there is probably a greater realisation than there was previously of the amount of um, practice which is of a torturous nature and the amount of ill-treatment and torture that goes on, uh, certainly within detention systems around the world that previously hadn't sim had just simply hadn't been understood and recognised to be what it is. Perhaps, as I indicated earlier, for too long the talk of torture was sort of the preserve of, of, of shall we say, at the top end of the uh, you know, regime's torturing political political opponents rather than what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis as part of you know, the ordinary warp and weft of life in far too many um, places. So in one sense, if there appears to be more torture, it could be that we are simply revealing more and it's better under, you know, understood for what it is and be called out for what it is and prompting reactions perhaps in different ways um, than, than before. The idea that you can address all this through mere political denunciation um, um, is, is, is probably not, you know, not, not the way forward. Of course, you need that top-level denunciation, but you know, real prevention you know, means getting into, you know, deeply into to embedded systems, structures, practices and assumptions. And that's the point I would like to finish on. It still never ceases to surprise and shock me the extent to which in popular imagination, in popular culture, in the media and others, torture is still so often presented as something which is indeed acceptable and and, and, and appropriate under certain circumstances, or even if it's projected as not appropriate, it is done in a way that leaves a lingering question mark about whether it should or shouldn't be. Um, you would not do that in relation to so many other forms of human rights violation. So why is it still acceptable to do that in relation to torture? Thank you. The last word will be from Dr. Modvik. My organization, Dignity Danish Institute Against Torture, started in 1982 as one of the world's first specialized rehabilitation centers for torture victims. Today, there are more than 150 such specialized centers providing rehabilitation to victims of torture. So uh, it may be that, uh, uh, that there's a hardening of the pop popular opinion, but there are also counter tendencies that acknowledge the right to rehabilitation and the inhumane nature of uh, uh, the human rights violation of torture. So I think there are uh, more complicated uh, tendencies than, than just one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We'll end it there. <laughs>